Welcome to the Wellness and Wanderlust podcast. We're here to demystify wellness and help you add a little adventure to your life. Tune in for a new episode every week where we'll hear from incredible guests and talk about ways to be happier and healthier in our new normal. I'm your host, Valerie Moses. Let's get started. Hey everyone, it's so great to have you join us for another fantastic week on the podcast. If you're new here, welcome. This show is all about designing our dream lives through small changes in our habits and health. I'm so grateful for this amazing community and for the inspiring guests who join us on the show from week to week. Thank you to everyone for being here today. In this episode, we are talking about vitality, how to bring more of it into our lives, and how we can truly define vitality for ourselves. Our guest is Dr. Jesse Haymeyer, a physician and certified nutrition specialist who practices data-driven, outcome-oriented functional medicine. We discuss her root cause approach to medicine and ways we can make healthy changes that last. Dr. Jesse shares what we could do to create a vision of vitality in our lives, common barriers to weight loss and how to overcome them, how to get off the roller coaster of yo-yo dieting, possible causes of inflammation in the body, and how to ditch the all or nothing mindset that has been instilled in so many of us. She has a ton of actionable tips in this one, so you may want to grab a pen and paper to take notes or even tune in a second time. Our sponsor for today's episode has a product I use literally every day. I started taking AG1 because my doctor recommended I start incorporating greens into my morning routine. And I wanted to cut back on some of the many vitamins I take with breakfast. I work in community engagement and PR, so I'm on the go quite a bit and time is a luxury. With one scoop of AG1, you're absorbing 75 high quality vitamins, minerals, whole food sourced ingredients, probiotics, and adaptogens to help you start your day right. I take AG1 every morning before breakfast, and it's great for digestion and gut health, energy, and immune health. AG1 is lifestyle friendly, whether you eat keto, paleo, vegan, dairy-free, or gluten-free, and contains less than one gram of sugar, no GMOs, and no nasty chemicals. AG1 has high quality ingredients that your body will actually absorb, and it's a great way to take care of yourself with a busy lifestyle. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash wanderlust. Again, that is athleticgreens.com slash wanderlust to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. All right, friends, now on to today's show. Hi, Dr. Jesse. Thank you so much for joining us at Wellness and Wanderlust today. Thank you so much for having me, Valerie. It's a pleasure to be with you and your listeners. Well, it is such a pleasure to have you on all the way from Switzerland, too. Yes, I am uh, sitting here looking at a lush green mountain and uh, it's getting the sun starting to go down a little bit, but the, the Swiss blue sky is, is peeking through still a bit. I am so jealous of that view. So we'll definitely have to talk about that and what brought you to Switzerland as well. But before we do that, why don't you first introduce yourself to our listeners and tell us a little bit about your wellness journey. Sure, absolutely. So my name is Dr. Jesse Haymeyer, and I am the founding physician of Well Empowered. And at Well Empowered, I practice data-driven natural medicine, also known as functional medicine. And really at the core of my Well Empowered work is my mission. And my mission is people bringing their gift fully to the world and inspiring others to do the same. And for me, it lives like a truth, like gravity, try arguing with it, you will not win, that health and vitality is foundational to authoring your life. And so for me, it's really a pleasure and a privilege to guide people and to partner with them in creating the health and vitality, you know, taking a root cause approach to creating the health and vitality that they say is foundational to authoring their life. I think there's so much with that too that goes into our vitality because I always did think it was truly diet and exercise. And those are both incredibly important, but there was so much that I didn't realize until I started seeing a functional medicine doctor myself that really goes into how we're functioning on a day-to-day basis. And that there was a lot more that I wasn't even thinking of in terms of my own wellness and definitely that vitality too. What, What exactly does vitality mean to you? Well, that is a great question. And what's to me most important is what does vitality mean to you? So I'm happy to share what it means for me, but really what I'm getting at is that vitality 
is something we each define for ourselves. And so when I work with people, I actually begin one of the beginnings of our partnership is guiding people through an exercise that allows them to get very, very clear on what I call their vision of vitality, their unique and personal heart plus mind definition of vitality. And what I find is when people get clear on this, their intention for their health and their life, the nature of the work itself really transforms, right? And so for me personally, vitality is an experience where I feel my best and I look my best and that gives me access to being my best. It gives me access to fully connecting with others. It gives me access to fully contributing and also It gives me access to inspiring or opening up opportunities for others to fully bring their gift to the world and fully contribute to the world. I really love that definition. I think that we don't give ourselves enough of that space to explore that. I think we kind of look at it in terms of, well, these are my lab numbers and I need to get my numbers to blank in order to be healthy. And that's really it. And we're not really thinking about, well, what is the quality of my life and how am I feeling? And what does my mental health look like through all of this? How am I showing up in the world? And I think that when we are pursuing that a little bit more and understanding our why, because I've certainly done the things that were quote unquote healthy for what I think were kind of the wrong reasons and almost a place of criticism and trying to just be perfect in some ways. And I've had other times where it was from that place of love that, hey, I want to feel good. I want to show up for the people in my life in a better way than what I've been doing. And I think it, it differs for everybody for sure. How can we discover what vitality means to us? Like what are some of the things we can do to define it? Yeah. So we can do this little exercise together. So your listeners, you and me can do this exercise together. And where I start with uh, guiding people and answering this question is by doing a little bit of time traveling. So in this first piece of time traveling, Valerie, I'm going to invite you and I'm going to invite your listeners to time travel five years into the future. And In this five-year future, I'd like you to envision your health as you intend and desire it occur. Envision your life. Envision what it is to be you, Valerie, walking around in the world. What's that experience like for you with your health as you intend and desire it be? And then the next step would be, and and I won't put you on the hot seat and have you do it right now, but the next step would be to actually put pen to paper and tell that story. Tell that story in first person present tense, right? So Valerie, I will ask you how old you are right now. 32. 32. Okay. So (laughs) it would be something like I'm 37 and right? And you would begin to tell that story, right? I'm 45. I would say I'm 50 and, right? So wherever you are, you you do a time travel to five five years in the future, and you really tell that story first person, present tense, so that it comes to life for you. You know, you know what it's like to get dressed in the morning or or go to a social engagement and, and you even step into what would become available in my life with my health as I intend it occur. So that is the first place I start with people in this process of what I call creating your vision of vitality. So I really, you know, I invite you, I invite your listeners to, you know, your listeners, you can pause right now and do that exercise, but giving yourself five minutes to really bring your mind and heart to creating that five-year future of what that would be with your health as you intend and desire it occur. I really love that. I think that's such a cool exercise and it gets you kind of excited and thinking of things more in a positive light. Because I think so often when we're visualizing what we want or start, you know, we might come up with that five-year plan, but it's very to-do list oriented and very much focused on, well, I should be doing this or by this point, I should have reached this milestone. But I think by 
kind of envisioning it more as your future and that this is what you're doing and you're already there and that you already have these things in a sense that it's exciting actually I think to ah. to be thinking about it gives you the permission to dream almost yeah absolutely and really get present to all the different places in your life that your health and vitality touch, right? Because just as you were saying earlier, it's very common for people to think about their health in the way of lab numbers and the scale and blood pressure and things like that. And by the way, those are all very important. I do a lot of collecting of data, right? I call it data-driven natural medicine because I collect so much information so that we can understand what actions are going to effectively lead people to that five-year future. We have to have that data. But by itself, you know, most people do not get super jazzed up about lab numbers. If they did, they wouldn't struggling to have them shift, right? They'd find someone to help them, you know, who knew how to guide them and they'd go just do that thing, right? So, you know, numbers are really important, but numbers live in our mind and our mind is amazing, but we have to marry our heart with this work or I just haven't really seen people be able to do this work, like you said, in, in, a, in a way that comes from self-love right? Because you were sharing, you know, there have been times in the past where you've taken cer certain actions, but they weren't really with a perspective of self-love. They were more about being perfect or maybe a, some beating yourself up. You kind of hinted like that. And I think most of us can relate to that. But, you know, what really becomes magical is when we start to practice, what is it for me to move from a place of self-love and honor my health? that becomes a very different journey. Yeah, and I think this also just gives us a bigger picture of what our lives are and how our health plays into it. Even as a podcaster, I thought focusing on wellness, I didn't realize how many areas pertain to our wellness that are outside of what we traditionally think of and how much creating your best life is wellness and that that comes from so many different places and not just the one thing. I I know for me with with the labs, I've had maybe two times that I've that I've had labs where it gave me really definitive of information where I am able to take a supplement and it fixed the numbers and I was good to go. But most of the time that information that I've gotten from diagnostics has been a little more complicated. And if I'm not coming at it from a place of love or a place of intention, it's a lot harder, I think, to make the changes that I need to make. And even one of my numbers that was more elevated not too long ago, my doctor had, you know, as we were kind of talking through it, because it was so much more elevated than usual, she started to ask me, well, did you have anything stressful going on in your life or what was happening there? And we were kind of able to determine that some of the external factors were impacting some of my numbers too. And so I think that really looking at this exercise, because I wasn't living in alignment in a sense with the things that as I'm kind of starting to think through it right now, that I would love to see in five years. Mm, sure. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. That's great. That even just being able to see that is powerful, right? Mm hmm. Absolutely. And so that's the thing I really love with functional medicine is that you're really looking at the whole person and really just diving into what what is causing someone to to have these symptoms pop up because, you know, I am very quick to take an ibuprofen, but maybe understanding, well, why am I having that type of pain or why is my body experiencing X, Y, and Z? For listeners that are not as familiar or maybe haven't been to a functional medicine doctor before, can you just give a little bit of a background on how it differs from other areas of medicine and what exactly that is? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. So functional medicine, in functional medicine, we take a root cause approach. So we seek to understand, just as you were pointing to, Valerie, we seek to understand what is causing these symptoms to arise. And from that perspective, we most of us are working with natural interventions, although there's some functional medicines who will incorporate medications, pharmaceuticals, things like that. But primarily, we lean on natural interventions, so supplementation, lifestyle, of course, nutritional shifts. And when I say lifestyle, that covers a lot of different things, uh, everything from stress management to movement to social connection, meaning things like that. And we're seeking to address that root cause such that the body heals and symptoms are resolved. 
So first is that root cause approach. The second thing that I would say has functional medicine be a distinct approach from more traditional medicine is that we take what's called a systems biology approach. And what that means is that we understand the interactions that occur through the systems in your body, right? As opposed to pretending that your liver works in isolation from your GI tract and that your hormones act separately from your skin, for example, right? So we look at all of these different systems and organs and we consider how they are connected and as opposed to taking things in isolation, right? And it, it again, it, it's not one's better than the other. They're two different approaches. And there are times when one approach is more appropriate than the other. So again, just to kind of review those, right? Functional medicine, we take a root cause approach and, and typically our interventions are natural. And we also take a systems biology approach in versus traditional medicine tends to be more symptom based, kind of like pill for an ill approach. And they tend to be a little more, uh, they take systems separate, uh, organs separate from the whole. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. And I, I love that approach to, you know, how these things are all connected because I've had so many times where I've gone to multiple specialists for a lot of different things and kind of dealt with them in, in isolation and then reading later that, hey, this might actually be connected to this other thing that I'm experiencing. And, you know, if I could all, if I could bring them all into the same room, great. But really kind of understanding and, you know, having that perspective of how maybe because of my thyroid doing a certain thing, my liver numbers may not be as good as they should be or whatever it is on my blood work. Maybe instead of looking at it in isolation, really understanding, well, this may be because of this other thing that's taking place and kind of looking at it. Yeah, really, I think bird's eye, like big, big picture approach to it. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. What brought you to functional medicine? So I like the people who I work with. I would say I'm a learner and I absolutely love and adore the body. I just think the body is one of the most spectacular things we could ever imagine. It's, it's nothing short of sheer magic. I even remember as a little girl before I could read you know, three, four years old, sitting on the floor with a National Geographic book that we had in our household and flipping through the pages and staring at this gorgeous photo of nerves <laughs> and just being amazed at like, wait, that's inside of me? No way, right? And so I, you know, from an early age, I, I just was always amazed by the body. And then after I graduated from undergraduate, after undergrad, I had gone to UCLA undergrad and, and stayed in California for a couple of years, worked as a physical therapy aide. And then when I moved back to Chicago, opened up the first high intensity strength training facility in Chicago. It was really the only boutique strength training facility at the time. This was in 2002. And then about four years later, I knew I wanted to learn more and expand my capacity to contribute to people. So I sold my half, this, this business, which is called Citywide Super Slow, shout out to uh, Chicago. Yeah, I is still there and I'm still a paying client when I'm back in Chicagoland. I absolutely adore it and the people there. Uh, but I knew at that point I wanted to go learn more. So I made my way ultimately to graduate school. And first got my doctorate in chiropractic medicine and never practiced as a traditional chiropractor, ultimately took that and, and bent my education to really emphasize natural interventions and completed my master's of science in nutrition and functional medicine also. And so I've, I've been living in the functional medicine world since then. And uh, it's really such a joy and a privilege to do this work with people. That's amazing. And I'm sure you see people who I, I think so many, so many patients that do go to functional medicine, it's because I think the traditional interventions aren't working. They're tired of masking a symptom 
or not really understanding why their body is doing whatever it is that it's doing. I have Hashimoto's and my numbers have have been elevated at certain points, but a lot of times it's really just my antibodies. But at the same time, I was still having a lot of the symptoms that come with the slow thyroid Mm -hmm. and kind of being told almost by my traditional endocrinologist at the time that I was crazy and that, you know, just diet and exercise. And again, that was all well and good. But when I asked for a little more feedback on what are the types of foods for what I'm dealing with, and they said I could go on Weight Watchers. Oh my gosh. That's amazing, Valerie. That is so good. And I was eating close to a paleo diet at that time. Well, maybe not at that time. I think I was in grad school at that time, but I've, yeah. I've you know, experimented with paleo, Whole30, plant-based at different points and still discovering, I think, what works best for my body. But they were kind of telling me, oh yeah, you can eat these processed. And I, I'm sure I could eat a ton of the one point little chocolate things. I I know I did that in college, but (laughs) you know, so I think you probably do have, I would imagine a lot of these patients that are coming to you that the traditional medicine, it just has not, it has not worked for them and maybe it's failed them. They've gotten unsatisfying answers, haven't really found out what's going on. So I'm sure it has to be so satisfying to be able to work with them to really uncover why these things are happening and help them to make those changes. It really is. I I mean, I just, yes, it is, it is a daily joy and every single day in a meeting, you know, at least once a day and sometimes two or three times, you know, someone who I'm working with will say something like, I've been struggling to solve this for a decade and I cannot believe, like, I'm just amazed that this is this problem's gone my skin is healed my digestion's normal i'm not bloated i'm whatever right i my weight is where i'd love it to be and i feel great and this isn't restrictive whatever it is i hear it all the time and it brings me so much joy and you know i'm definitely not an us against them kind of a gal right i i think there's a place for i well there definitely is a place for for traditional medicine it's just important to know what's right when and i think for most people one of the biggest sources of upset is is that they have, you know, a story I'll hear is, you know, someone goes to their doctor and they go to their doctor and they go to their doctor. And it, and it sounds a little bit like that was a bit like your experience before you found your functional medicine practitioner and they aren't met with answers. And, you know, maybe they get a diagnosis somewhere along the way, but they don't have a solution and they feel overwhelmed. They feel a bit of despair and like they're they're almost like there's just got to be a solution what is it and then somehow along the way they find their way to functional medicine and and it can be just really life changing for people who have been you know kind of beating their heads against the wall with with a health conundrum that they really do know in their gut like there is a solution to this and i'm just not finding the right person but you know unfortunately often in listen like you know traditional medicine practitioners, they're, they're overwhelmed and they are, they're doing the best they can. But I do look forward to the, to a future where there is more collaboration and I'm seeing it happen. You know, I have MDs who refer to me and, and I certainly refer to MDs when appropriate. So I think change is happening and that's a really great thing for everyone. I love that. You know, I have a few traditional doctors who also will sometimes look at integrative approaches and they will like look a little bit outside the box and try different things. And at the same time, there, there are times where it's just, Hey, maybe a prescription for something really is what I need. And that's just, but at least being able to kind of explore that a little bit and try not to go for the medication first, if there's an intervention I can take or if there's something I can do. So I really do like, I I love when, when you find those doctors on both sides that are willing to collaborate and can kind of, you know, you take the, you know, you take, you take what works for you, I think from whatever practice that is. Cause I've also had where I was really sick and I needed, you know, life changing surgery and there, it just, it differs, I think by person to person. But I think the fact that functional focuses so much on the root cause and not just masking the symptoms, I, I really, I really do love that. 
something that you focus on in your practice too. And we have we have a very large female audience as well. I think we're about 85% female audience. And so this is something that probably the majority of us have struggled with at one point or another, but that sustained weight loss. And you talk a lot about weight loss resistance. And we see the articles about the stubborn five pounds and kind of roll our eyes a little bit. But at the same time, we do hit those plateaus. And I think that there are things sometimes going on in the body that maybe keeping us from reaching those goals. Can you talk a little bit about what some of those root causes look like? Yeah, absolutely. So I will point to, so I would say there are three common recurring physiological barriers to weight loss. So I'll, I'll kind of list them and then I'll talk about them one by one. The first one is elevated inflammation. The second is insulin resistance, but not like red flag on the lab insulin resistance. So elevated inflammation, insulin resistance. And then the third one is compromised detoxification. So detox pathways gunked up. So elevated inflammation, insulin resistance, detox pathways gunked up. And to say a little bit more about each of those, elevated inflammation right? It is, it's actually a measurable phenomenon, right? I will talk to people in, you know, a 30 minute complimentary consultation and they'll say something to me like, I'm just really inflamed. And I'll ask them how that shows up in their body. And they'll say, you know, I just get really bloated and, you know, I break out or whatever's true for them. My joints hurt, my uh, skin gets red, however, the inflammation shows up in their body. And that's really helpful because inflammation can certainly be experiential, but also it shows up in numbers. And so there are numbers we can look at to understand is inflammation elevated in a in a real physiological manner and the number i lean on most often there are a number of things i test around inflammation but one is called hscrp high sensitivity c-reactive protein hscrp and that assesses systemic system-wide chronic long-term inflammation and when inflammation is elevated your body is going to be in a metabolic slowdown mode aka fat storage mode so when inflammation is elevated your body is going to be conserving fuel like it's its job and if you think about it it's ingenious this is like the stuff about the body that i'm like wow you are so smart right and the reason why it's ingenious if you think about we don't have to go back that far but let's just pretend it's 600 years ago if someone injures themselves they need to let's say they hurt their leg and they can't go hunt and gather right uh whichever of those two jobs was theirs well then their body better be able to conserve those calories so they don't starve to death as they are without food for a second longer than usual, right? So this inflammation comes in both to call in the healing process, but in the as it is elevated, it is slowing down metabolism. So this, this being can quite literally live for longer off of the calories it has reserved. So pretty genius. Fortunately, it's just rare that anyone would need that mechanism these days, but knowing that someone's inflammation is elevated helps us really understand what targeted approach we need to be so that the body can shift from fat storage mode into being metabolically optimized, churning along. So uh, so that's number one. The second one of insulin resistance, again, I don't mean insulin, you know, lab high. I actually mean suboptimal levels of fasting insulin. And really for me, suboptimal begins at about nine, definitely double digits, but about nine. And most lab values, you won't get a red flag on insulin until it's about 19 or 20. So that's a far cry off of what I would call suboptimal. And so when insulin, when someone is dealing with that, again, their body is going to be pushing them. It's going to be pushed into calorie conservation, fat storage mode when there's a little bit of insulin resistance. And again, knowing that is gives us access to understanding what targeted actions we need to take in order to address that. And then the last one I mentioned was, you know, gunked up detox pathways. Now the word detoxification you hear it all over the place. It's a very chic word. It, you know, let's market a supplement by calling it a detox support supplement. But there are actual physiological processes that happen in our body 
that are core to detoxification. And there's a lot we could say about that. But the thing to know is that when detox pathways aren't able to either, let's just say the amount of toxins coming in, the body just can't keep up with them. That's one potential thing. And number two would be toxins are having a hard time getting out of the body. Classic symptom of that would be constipation. If someone is constipated, they are reabsorbing toxins. There is a process that happens that the body reabsorbs toxins when we're constipated. So there's a, a lovely saying that goes with that is we're not just what we're eat, what we eat, we're what we don't excrete. So uh, so that's that's mm-hmm. one way. That's the second way. And then the third way detox pathways can get gunked up is you know the things in between the toxins coming in and the toxins going out, all the magic that happens there, we could be nutrient deficient, we could have genetic mutations that simply mean those enzymes need a little extra help to run as well as the average Joe or Jill, right? So when detox pathways are gunked up, one of the things that's going to happen is toxins are going to build up, they're going to damage our cells. By the way, they'll probably be causing inflammation. Also, though they might be playing a role in insulin sensitivity, but they will also likely lead to elevated estrogen because estrogen, you know, it's not what we typically think of as a toxin, but even our hormones go through those same detox pathways that environmental pollutants go through, that heavy metals go through, alcohol goes through. So when our detox pathways are gunked up, ultimately we will end up with a higher estrogen load and that can create some weight loss resistance. That's so fascinating. And I think it's so funny because the C-reactive protein, that was the first thing that came up on my on my initial labs. And the, I think the lab paperwork says that it's more that you're, I think, at risk of having a serious cardiovascular event. Yeah. 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 Uh And so I was terrified. I'm like, I was like eating, I was eating okay at the time, but all of a sudden I think I was maybe 27 years old, 26, 27 years old. And I'm thinking, Oh my God, I'm going to die of a heart attack. Right. And when I, when I got to my doctor and she's explaining to me, no, this really has more to do with the levels of inflammation in your body and kind of understanding that and understanding that, yeah, there's a lot going on in our bodies that could be causing these things. I think my insulin finally went down after a long period of time, but many of us have experienced at least one, if not multiple of these, of these barriers. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So when you have someone that comes in and I know that I'm sure it has to differ at at times for, for different things that might be going on in the body, but what are some of the practices you recommend? Because I think for many of us that yo-yo dieting, it's probably making everything a little bit worse, I would say metabolically too, but we're up and down maybe because we're not addressing what, what our bodies truly need and we're going kind of the one size fits all. Yes. So what, what do you recommend? Well, to your point, because I don't take a one size fits all, I get very targeted mm-hmm. in, you know, what is our next step moving ahead. But from a high level, you know, what might someone do who, you know, is listening, right? The first thing is, okay, get very clear on your intention for your health and your life, right? That five year future of your health as you desire and intend it to intend it occur. And then from there, step back to where you are now. And Looking at the gap between where you are now and this five-year future, start to brainstorm. This is not beat yourself up storm. This is brainstorm. You know, what are some things that I, I'm not currently doing or doing with sufficient consistency that I believe would help me arrive at this place that would contribute to my journey to this being true in five years? So do some brainstorming, right? And then from there, Pick one action, one new action, and take that one action. That's one thing is, is, you know, these all or nothing diets, they're for the birds. You know, Whole30, show me the person. Day 31, 99.9% of people are saddled up with like a large pizza and a bottle of wine, right? It's just, they just, mm-hmm. it's the, it's the all or nothing approach is so grounded in, you know, it's either deprivation or overindulgence. Those are the two options. And they're both born of self-aggression. So, you know, that's why I start with people creating their vision of vitality, because that's born of self-love. 
So when you start to look at, okay, what would be my next step in this journey, this journey of self-love, you come up with wisdom that has been there all along. It's like excavating jewels. And, you know, you start to play a better game, right? Forget the perfect game. Stepping into, okay, what's a better game I could play? And like really play on a daily basis, just what's a better game? Doesn't have to be, you know, super fancy or sexy. It can be, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to walk around the block today. Cause I can just, I just know I'm not getting enough steps. Great. Walk around the block and then walk around the block tomorrow and the next day and the next day. And just playing that journey of layering on just a better game, a better game, you know, and I can tell you that, you know, for me and my health and vitality journey, what I do now it's totally different than what I did 10 years ago or 20 years ago. And it's really been, you know, it's evolving journey. It's, it's, you know, just like you were sharing about how you've really started to look at your own health in a different way. It's like, may we always evolve. May we always find something new to learn and bring into our lives and contribute to others and, and learn from each other. Absolutely. I mean, I feel like, I, I mean, I, I'm very fortunate with hosting this podcast. I get to talk to so many amazing experts like you where I am able to kind of, by learning from people, I can add some tools to my tool belt and figure out, hey, this might be something that I should try. And maybe this is something it may not work for me. Maybe it will work for the next person listening. But to be able to kind of seek that knowledge out for myself and to understand that it's going to be different at different times because again, like that whole 30, it was great for educating me on, Hey, my body does not feel good when I'm eating these things. It was not great for sustained change. Eating relatively paleo was helpful at certain times in my life. And then there have been other times where I felt better if I had a little bit of grains in my diet or just kind of being open to the fact that those things can change for us too. And depending on maybe what's going on, because it isn't one size fits all, but kind of understanding that and then being willing to take on different practices and just try new things to kind of up level a little bit more. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. And, and I love what you just shared, really dancing with your reality of the moment, right? And that, that I think is, is really, really key is, you know, listen, there's so much noise out there about how to eat and how to move. And, you know, people talk about nutrition like it's a religion. It's it's so funny to me, Valerie, when people say, oh, do you believe in paleo or do you believe in intermittent fasting? And really, I, I understand, right? They're, everybody's marinating in this paradigm of that relates to nutrition like religion, right? But, but you know, I believe in someone fueling their body from a place of self-love in a way that allows them to experience the vitality they're committed to. And that could look a million different ways. But I will say one thing I would say is if it's not sustainable, to me, it's not a solution for the most part, right? There are times where there are nutritional interventions that are appropriate knowing that they're going to be short-term interventions, right? I'll work with people, for example, sometimes I encounter people with a histamine sensitivity, and I won't go into the details of that, but just know that a histamine sensitivity, a nutritional, a, a dietary approach for a histamine sensitivity, it takes a lot of hoop jumping to stay on a low histamine diet. But the goal is not to keep someone on a low histamine diet forever. The goal is to address the root cause of the histamine sensitivity. At the same time, let's go on a low histamine diet so that symptoms can resolve. And then let's expand so that you can have a little more, you can have more sway and you don't have the symptoms, right? So, so there are times where like a th therapeutic nutritional approach might be appropriate. That wouldn't be long-term, but when we're talking about how to eat on a more regular day-to-day -day basis, for me, if it's not sustainable, it's, it's not a solution because if you can't sustain the action, you can't sustain the outcomes and that just doesn't work. Yeah. Cause then we do fluctuate the same 10 pounds either way. And that's not good for our bodies either. Yeah. Yeah. It's not good for our bodies. It's not good for our, our, our spirits. It's yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm.
it's not good for my wallet if I have to keep buying clothes in different sizes. That's right. That's right. I actually, I spoke with someone a few weeks ago who was like, I have all these gorgeous clothes in my closet. And I want to be able to wear them again. I'm like, okay, let's do this. Let's make that happen. Yeah. But you have to promise me that you're going to get rid of your other clothes along the way, you know, not tomorrow, mm -hmm. but in the journey, it's like, let's communicate to the universe that this is real. I'm, I'm committed to this. I'm, I'm committed to honoring my health as sacred. And this is part of it. Absolutely. And I think, again, that stems from that place of love. I think that's that's so key. Now, for those of us who are very all or nothing, I listen to a lot of Gretchen Rubin and she talks about your moderators and your abstainers. And I always think of myself as an abstainer, like if it's anywhere near me, I'm going to eat it or <laughs> whatever it is. And there are others who have an easier time, I think, with moderation. What tips do you have for getting out of that all or not nothing mindset and like some sustainable practices that we can take on to, to kind of show our yourself that grace. Yeah. Well, and by the way, I absolutely adore Gretchen Rubin. And when I, when I work with people, I give them fulfillment exercises, AKA homework and her book better than before. There are a couple of chapters that I include in that. And one of them is moderator versus abstainer. So to me, that conversation moderator versus abstainer is actually a little different than the all or nothing approach. And the reason I say that is that I would guess, Valerie, as an abstainer, there are certain foods you're an abstainer with, but you're probably not like whole 30 abstention, right? Like, no. Right, exactly. Right. So right. to me, that's just a way of honoring your truth as it is at this moment, right? In, in five years, you might have a different truth right? Five years from now, let's just pretend it's ice cream for you. So maybe five years from now, you find yourself at a place where you're like, gosh, I'm just not owned by it anymore. I mean, I could actually have like a bite of ice cream and be okay. Maybe that's true. And, and maybe it's not. You know, I know for myself at one point, I was owned by sugar. And I really got like, I don't want to be owned by anything. I don't want my future to be dictated by a food, right? To feeling owned by it. So for me, it was about, you know, and that, by the way, you may recall the title of that chapter you're speaking to is called Free From French Fries, right? She's speaking to <laughs> freedom, right? And so being able to see, listen, if I'm really honest with myself, I cannot keep my act together around a box of Oreos in my closet cupboard. That's just being honest with yourself. That's not right, wrong, good, bad. It's like, okay, good. So don't just like you wouldn't encourage an alcoholic to go hang out in the bar. Don't put the Oreos in your, in your cabinet, you know? So for me, it became a journey over time of just like, no, thank you. And, and now really I am at a place where I can be around sweets. It's not a big deal to me, but I also really mostly don't eat them because I do know that if I go back to them, like they will own me again. Like that hasn't, that mm -hmm. part of who I am is there and there's nothing wrong with that. I just know that I have zero interest in ever being owned by them again. So I just honor that yeah. truth. Yeah. Cause I've definitely had the times where when I was going super processed and then even the littlest thing happened and you start to cry and uh, I feel hungover. There are all of like the difficult or, you know, negative ex experiences that you have, I think sometimes from the things that just don't agree with you, but can be a little bit addictive. The Oreos, they now make a mega stuff Oreo, which is horrible. And I wish I didn't know that. But I also love that you know that, Valerie. That's very funny. <laughs> <laughs> and I promise your listeners, we did not talk about Oreos before we got on today. I had no idea. <laughs> no, no. And I cannot, you know, if they, if they were somewhere, where like I can have one or two great not in the house I could eat it yeah. more than I'm comfortable sharing and that's what it's wise to know that it's just wise to know that yeah so any other tips that you have for kind of creating that vitality in your life you know whether it's from a nutrition perspective or just daily practices that you recommend so yes I would say in the way of daily practices what I recommend everyone to take on if they are not currently is creating daily bookends. And by that, creating a bookend at the beginning of your day where you're connecting with your intention for your health and your life, right? You're actually 
bringing your mind and your heart to that five-year future that you intend to be your truth. And that doesn't need to be complicated and it doesn't need to take a long time. It can be 30 to 60 seconds, but really done with full presence. So that could be one bookend. The other bookend at the other, you know, in the evening, I am a huge fan of people counting their wins. So as you mentioned, most of your listeners are women. And I do happen to know that a lot of us women's, women can be kind of hard on ourselves. And so counting your wins is really an opportunity every day at the end of the day to actually write down. And I do recommend pen and paper bedside. Write down what you'd like to acknowledge yourself for. And nobody gets to say anything about what that list says you get to say what it is. It can be as simple as I parked one parking space farther away. It can be as simple as I had half the fries instead of all the fries. It can be I went grocery shopping. Really, there's just no thing that is too small to acknowledge if it occurs to you as like, it really took something for me to do that. Great. Then I want you to acknowledge that. So the bookends of the day, at the beginning, getting connected to your intention for your health and your life, and in the evening, counting your wins, acknowledging yourself for ways and places you have elevated the actions that align with your intention in big or small ways. I really love that. And I, it's so funny, too, because I think as women, we're very good at counting the wins for everybody around us. So it's really just almost using that skill set for ourselves. We're so good at celebrating, you know, even the smallest things that our loved ones and that our friends are doing. So yeah, really applying that to our own lives. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I think these practices are just so great for creating the life you want to live and kind of getting in the right mindset so that you can make some of the, you know, maybe more challenging changes and start to adjust things a little bit more. So I, I love everything that you're doing and just this concept of living in vitality and thinking about that five-year future. And I think that's something too, when we're so focused on doing everything for everyone else and we need that outer accountability at times to be focusing, and this is another Gretchen Rubin, but that, you know, on that future self. And so to be able to kind of externalize that a little bit and be doing these things for the future that we want is so powerful. Absolutely. Yes. Well, this is, this is amazing. I would love to ask you as well. Um, you know, we have a few rapid fire questions that we ask all of the guests. Can I switch over and ask you a few rapid fires as well? Absolutely. Valerie, fire away. Lovely. Well, this one's a tough one because we've been talking about quite a few of them, but what's your top wellness tip? My top wellness tip is to bring both kindness and honesty to yourself. So kindness, we've talked about a lot. And the honesty part is really seeing what you're doing and what you're not doing and seeing where you are and where you're not. And it really takes something to bring both of those to the moment, right? Most often people are kind and they don't look, right? They don't step on the scale or they don't count how many alcoholic beverages they're having or measure how much sweets they're having, stuff like that, right? Or they're honest and they beat themselves up. So I would say practicing marrying those two, being kind and honest. That's so important because you're you're so right. It can be so easy to either beat ourselves up or it's fine. I can, you know, have as many boxes of the mega stuff Oreos as I want. And now why why did I gain 10 pounds this week from right. you know <laughs> or obviously exaggeration, but I think kind of having that balance and adding that to it is is so huge because we can't beat ourselves up for doing these things, but to really be in like to be honest with ourselves and to really acknowledge, hey, this is th these are some of the things I'm doing because we also do things mindlessly at times too. Yeah, and so if you bring you know mindfulness to it, right, you can actually start to see if you create structures where you're okay. I'm going to be honest, you know whatever that looks like for you, people will know what there is for them. Maybe they're going to start looking at how many steps they're getting a day. Okay, that's great. That's just a way of being honest. And maybe they're going to start counting their alcoholic beverages. Okay, great. 
or how many hours of sleep they're getting. You know, there's so many different places. And again, meeting yourself where you are, right? Some of your listeners will have more experience and have more mastery in the level level of health and wellness and vitality than others. And that's just life. I mean, that's zero problem. We're all in different places, right? So, you know, honoring where you are and, and really keeping the eye on your ball and looking at, okay, what's the next thing for me to look at? That's, that's a great place to be and, and bringing kindness to that. I love that. What a, what a great tip. Now this one, I, I may know what the answer is, but I may not. Um, where, where is your favorite travel destination? Uh, well, yeah, I, I will say living in Switzerland, I'm going to have to say Switzerland. It's, yeah. And I know that's like a country I'm giving you, but the beauty in this country cannot be overstated. This morning, I, I the one of the pleasures of being here and working in the U.S. is I can go hiking in the morning. So this morning, there's a mountain that is, uh, you know, probably about six miles away from where we are. It's called Rigi, R-I-G-I. And just down the road from here, got up and went hiking with a group of women. It was absolutely superb. So um, I could give you, you know, 10 different locations here in Switzerland that are really, really high on the list of favorite places. Oh, I can only imagine. And can you tell us a little bit too, we didn't really get into this during the interview, but what brought you to Switzerland? So my husband, my husband is in cryptocurrency and where we live, it's a town called Zug, Z-U-G. It's about 12 miles or so outside of Zurich and it's called Crypto Valley. So it's a small town of about 30,000 people, but it's very international and it's just like crypto 24 seven here. It's actually, it's pretty funny. That's amazing. Yeah. That's yeah. so cool. And you've been there, you said for about a year. Yep. We've been here for about a year. That's amazing. And what a what an amazing place to to relocate to and get to, you know, you sent me through email the beautiful Swiss view to have that out your window is just, I mean, how how incredible. And I mean, that is a part of our wellness too, I think, to be in a place that we want to be in. Definitely. The beauty here is is amazing. And, you know, it's really a unique experience to get to be submerged in a culture that is really transparent about its values. It's transparent. If you just lived here, if you came here with the question of mine, what do the Swiss value? And you didn't talk to anyone, but you just lived here and observed for about three or four weeks, you would pretty quickly be able to work backwards and come up with the answers. They value finances in the way of security, right? There's not a lot of, I, I don't see a lot of people showing wealth around here, but they are very clear about prioritizing financial security of their people. For example, service people, Switzerland's an expensive country, but um, you know, service people make on average four to 5,000 Swiss francs a month, which is pretty close to the dollar. So just call it four to $5,000 a month. That's for someone who's working at the train station or cleaning a hotel, like they make, I mean, again, it's an expensive place to live, but they, they make sure people don't have to worry about basic things like what am I going to wear and how am I going to feed my family and where am I going to live? So that's pretty awesome. They also value safety. There's so much we could say about that, but it's, it's really awesome. They also value nature and beauty. And, and you see that in how their recycling program works. You almost need a PhD to be able to follow it. Uh, but you also see that in the way that everything is closed on Sundays with the exception of a few restaurants and the small grocery store at the at the train station. And things close on Saturdays, like clothing stores, any kind of store you'd go into closes at about five. And, and even during the week, they close at six or so. So they really value people enjoying their lives. It's a, it's a special place. <laughs> I mean, that is, again, a huge part of wellness, just living. And of course, you know, we want to we want to enjoy what we what we do for work, you know, our careers. But to be able to find that fulfillment and that joy and to create a culture where you can work hard and then you can also enjoy the the time for other things, too. So I, I love the way they prioritize that. That's definitely a place I want to visit in the near future. And, and if and when you do, let me know. <laughs> we'll plan a great hike. 
Yes, please. Yes, please. Now, on a completely different note, if you were an animal, what animal would you be and why? Oh, that's such a good question. I think I would be, I think I'd be a jaguar because they're so beautiful and like their movement is beautiful. How they move is beautiful and how they run is beautiful. There's something so um, artistic about the way they move. And yeah, so I, I think that's what I'd be. Although I, I don't know that I could do what it's required for, well, I guess if I were a jaguar. <laughs> in order to eat. Right. Uh, but yeah, I, that's what I'm going to go with. That is so cool. Yeah. I was going to say, I would probably have to be like a vegetarian Jaguar. I or something. I, I'm not I, a vegetarian human, but, uh, but I don't have no. to like, do the same things that they have to do to get their meat. So yeah. I know. I know. As soon as I see all of like the sweet little animals, like, Oh, I know. Uh, yeah. No, but that's, that's a great answer. Now, if you could master a completely different skill, what would that be? A completely different skill. Okay, if I could master a completely different skill, well, it's I'm going to call out one because we're in Switzerland. This is very Swiss appropriate. I'd be a fearless and very skilled skier. Yes, <laughs> it's perfect for the mountains here. So I've only skied a few times in my times in my life, and I would not call myself a fearless, superbly skilled skier. So yes, that's what I would be. <laughs> that's the skill I would master. That is awesome. I have, I've actually never skied in my life. Um, but I think like what, what a cool skill. I, I mean, you are really in the perfect place for it. Yes. I, it is funny when people, this last, when, you know, people have naturally asked us, Oh, have you guys gone skiing? I'm like, not yet, <laughs> but I will, we will, we will. I'm like, just put me on the bunny hills. I actually, a, a couple of months ago, I was talking to a Swiss woman and she was, you know, talking about their upcoming ski trip. And I said, Oh, how old were you when you learned to ski? She said, I learned how to ski before I learned how to walk. I was like, Oh, that is wow. so sweet. That's so great. So, so I just need to be on the bunny hills with like the three-year-olds and it'll be, it'll all be fine. Well, I will join you on the bunny hills then. Yeah. Awesome. Great. Yeah. And my final question for you from these rapid fire questions, what's next on your bucket list? Well, I'll give you a few. Okay. So travel, I've not been to Sicily and I'd really like to go to Sicily. So like Taramina, Sicily, you know, like that world that's, that's on the travel front. I don't have any plan. We don't have any plans yet, but that is on the list. Other areas. So professionally, I currently mostly do one-on-one -on -one work and am going to be expanding to bring in group work professionally, which I'm really excited about because that gives us an opportunity to touch many more people and contribute to people's journey and mastery of their health and vitality. So those are two two things ahead. That's awesome. Both of those sound amazing. Sicily, absolutely beautiful. And getting to do group work, I think you can uncover so much when you have a few people with some similarities, some differences coming together in a room with some common purpose. That's such a such a great way to reach people and it just from a different perspective almost. Yes, absolutely. Well, those are both amazing and congratulations for that. That's that's so huge that you'll be launching that. Before I let you go, can you tell our listeners a little bit about what you offer and how they can find you and connect? Yeah, absolutely. So as I mentioned, I offer one on one work and will be offering groups work coming up here in the next two months ahead. And you can reach me at wellempower.com and schedule a complimentary consultation to explore working together in the way of, you know, different things I work with. As Valerie mentioned, I like to call it empowered and sustained weight loss mastery. And, you know, other things I work with people commonly are on our relieving uh, digestive distress, whether that's constipation, diarrhea, bloating, the whole shebang, and all things hormonal related, whether that's irregular periods, PMS, infertility, all a skin, acne, that kind of stuff. So uh, it would be a pleasure to connect with any of your listeners and, and explore collaborating. 
That's amazing. I'll make sure to link your your website in the show notes and your contact so they can connect. I think all of that is just so inspiring and the way that you approach it from that place of vitality and really just uncovering what that means for each individual patient. Because again, I'm sure you know it differs for every single person listening right now. And so really helping us to explore and understand how we can really create those best lives for ourselves. That is such a gift. And so I just want to thank you so much for everything you do and for coming on the show and for sharing with us today. Thank you so much, Valerie, for having me. It has been such a pleasure to connect with you and uh, to be with you and your audience. First of all, who is dying to plan a trip to Switzerland now? I had such a blast connecting with Dr. Jessie Heimeyer and learning all about her approach to wellness and vitality. I love that she's all about defining vitality for yourself. And the exercises she describes in our conversation are so helpful for figuring out what you truly want your life to look like. I very much fall into the trap of all or nothing thinking, and this hasn't served me very well in the past. So I loved what she had to say about bringing both honesty and kindness to yourself. I find the practices she shared in our episode to be so helpful, and I'm really excited to continue integrating them into my own life. I have linked Dr. Jessie's information in the show notes so you can connect with her. Be sure to reach out to her and tag us on social if you enjoyed today's conversation. Love to know what you think. As always, I want to thank each and every one of you for being a part of this community, for tuning in and sharing your time and your energy with us. If you have a topic that you'd like us to explore in a future episode, please feel free to email me at Valerie at wellness at wanderlust.net or reach out to me on Instagram at wellness of wanderlust blog. I say this every single week, but one of the best ways you can lend your support to the show is to leave a rating and review on your favorite podcasting app. It helps people find the show better. It lets us know what you think, and it takes just a few minutes out of your day. So if you are tuning in from week to week or today's episode really resonated with you, I would love to know what you have to say. I hope each and every one of you has a fantastic day and can't wait to see you next time.